horses and today we are going on with our stories collected by Margaret Dorrance and Tom St Rhines about the life and work of Tom Dorrance, more than a horseman. So today's story comes from Tim Erickson. When I first met Tom, Tom came by the Hayward Ranch near La Grange in July of 1961. Tom and Francis Butler worked for my dad, Paul Erickson, for almost 16 years. And if they ever took a vacation, a lot of them were spent visiting Tom and Rosita Marvel at the 25 Ranch near Battle Mountain, Nevada. Tom Butler worked for the Marvels in the 1940s and early 50s and became good friends with them. When they were visiting in the spring of 1961, Tom Dorrance was there. Tom Butler asked Tom Dorrance if he would stop by my dad's place when he was in California. Tom showed up mid-morning in his little stock truck. It would hold about three horses, blue cab over Ford, I think, pulling a camper, camper trailer behind it. Had his saddle, bedroll, and a few other things in the back of the truck. He didn't have any horses with him. I don't remember him ever having a horse with him when he would come by with that little truck. I had three young horses I was riding. I'd just turned 16 a few weeks before, so I rode them around a little so he could see how they were going. Tom didn't say much. A man of few words until he got to be about 80 years old, then he became a real ham. But he did say, they don't seem to be bothered. And I wasn't sure what he meant. I later asked Tom Butler what he meant by that. And he said, Tom meant your horses were relaxed, not troubled. He only stayed a couple of hours, had lunch with Tom and Francis, and then was gone. The next spring, Tom Butler and I had a couple of colts to start and wondered where Tom Dorrance was and if he would come by the ranch. Tom would show up when he would say he would and stay two or three days in his camper trailer and then be on his way. Those first few times he showed us how to use the flag, get the horses up to the fence to get on them, rope them, lead them by a foot, get the rope under their tail and try to do these things without getting them too troubled or scared or work through those trouble spots, as he called them. He'd offer them instead of making them do something and wait until they respond. These were mainly the green ones and getting them started. But he also said, when you have a job to do, get it done. Don't worry about what you have to do to get your horse where he needs to be, but don't let the herd get away. Tom would help us and we didn't usually get it all figured out, but he'd say, just kind of work on it. If it gets too frustrating, let it go and don't worry about it. The next time I come by, we'll see if things are better. And then he was on his way again. Tom Butler and I always felt we were always a little in the dark after he left, kind of like we were hanging in midair, not knowing quite what to do, which was true. But he wanted us to work on it and see if we could figure things out or at least improve a little. He would come by every year for the next few years. In the spring of 1966, Tom Marvel was going to start some young horses at the Martin Ranch, south of Battle Mountain, and Tom Dorrance was going to be there. Tom Butler and I were able to go to the ranch for three to four days. I guess the horses were two and three year olds, not sure, but never had been handled. The young horses were saddled and turned loose in a big round corral with some other horses. I guess there were about half a dozen or so saddled. Then he would start with the first one saddled, catch him by the left hind foot and have the rider walk up to put the snaffle bit on him. 
That usually took a little while. Then cinch up, cinch up, step on the colt, and Tom would take that hind foot off with a hook and move the horse and rider around the small corral. Most of them moved without help and moved in various ways on their own. Next, he'd turn you out in a big corral with loose horses. When everyone was on and in the big corral, Tom would move us around one way and then the other, using a flag from his horse. I know Tom had done this many times in this way, but this was my first experience like that. Tom rode up to me, handed me a piece of a slicker and told me how I could move my horse around with it, bringing it forward and backwards, one side and then the other. Well, I got to playing around and when I got near one of the other riders, I would shake the slicker at their horse and he would speed up or turn back and we were having some fun with that. Tom was watching, but didn't say anything. Then my horse spooked at the slicker and jumped sideways and reared up and started to buck. He bucked me off and stepped on my ankle and then Tom rode over to ask me if I was okay. I said it was fine and then he caught the horse and I got back on him and he handed me the slicker again. Then he said, you know that chain roll was put on that saddle for a reason, not just for looks. If a horse starts to buck, try to get a hold of it and it'll keep you your seat in the saddle. And if you're using the slicker on a green horse and he spooks, you can reach for the roll on your cantle and the slicker will be behind your leg and he can't see it so much and he'll settle down. Or you can just let the slicker drop, but keep a hold of the roll. He had a little grin on his face while he was telling me this. I learned that day what a chain roll is for, and I've had to use it many times. There's been a few times I missed it and everything else I was reaching for, but it works. Well, if I can get a hold of it quick enough. In 1977, Tom and Margaret moved to the Hayward Ranch, so we worked together most of the time except when they were periodically putting on a clinic. We spent a lot of time in the mountains, trailing cattle in the spring, then gathering them and driving them down to winter country in the fall. Sometimes Tom and I would be up in the mountains alone, working and get in after dark. We'd get the fire going in the cook stove and have supper. One night, he said, let's have some biscuits. I said I didn't know how to make them, so he showed me how to make drop biscuits. So then I'd make them every night. Now look, I know there's not a lot to making them, but it was a breakthrough for me. Tom showed me how, and I was pretty proud of myself. One time, Tom and I took two young boys to the mountains, Rob and Joel Munro, for a few days when we were gathering cattle. The boys were about 12 and 14 years old and each had a horse and wanted to do some cowboying. One morning, we got a few cattle together in a meadow, Drew Meadow, maybe 30 or 40 head of cattle. We decided the boys, Rob and Joel, could follow them up the trail that was alongside the creek for a couple of miles until they came to Jones Meadow. We told them it was a small meadow, about 10 acres, and a road went through the middle of it. Tom said, there'll probably be more cattle up there when you arrive, so hold them all up there until we, Tom and Tim, get there, <laughs> which may be a couple of hours more. When Tom and I arrived at Jones Meadow, Rob wasn't there. Joel told us that back down the trail, a mile or so, they heard a cow ball across the creek. So Rob went to get her and started going away from the herd and Rob was right behind her. That was the last time Joel saw Rob riding off into the sunset, I mean into the bush, brush even. We were concerned but decided to wait a while before going to look for him. About 30 to 45 minutes later here comes the cow and right behind her is Rob on his sweaty horse. Rob told us that the cow went the wrong way and he stayed with her because I said, bring everything you find. 
he said she went through all kinds of brush it's everywhere and then she went between two big pine trees with him right behind her and in doing so his stirrups hit the tree on each side of his horse and pushed his feet back and bowed him forward on the horse's neck he did stay on the horse and get his feet back in the stirrups and finally got the cow we all had a good laugh about it and started the herd towards our camp stone meadow tom told me later that rob was just green enough that he wasn't going to quit that cow he said if he'd had a little more experience he would probably have let her get away tom was amused by that little incident we didn't get into camp that night until about 9 p.m the spring is in the horse meadow and i guess a horse loose a loose horse stepped on the shut-off valve and broke it off and drained the spring box. So no water. We got a bucket of water from the creek, lit the lanterns and started to fix a little supper. Joel, the youngest, at 12 years old, said he was going to bed, too tired to eat, dirty from the dust all day, but he needed some rest. Tom said that Rob had determination and wasn't going to let that cow get away as long as he could keep her in sight and because I told them to bring anything you find. That cow was probably glad to catch up with the herd and wasn't going to try to get away again as long as she knew Rob was there. Next morning, after fixing the water system, it was getting late and we still had to trail the cattle about 10 miles to get to Stone Meadow in our camp. It was also getting hot and some of the cattle were starting to drift off the trail. Tom was working the drag with the boys and he told Joel, get off your horse and hand me your bridle reins, crawl in the bush and bark like a dog and get those cows back on the trail. Joel said he turned to Rob and said, is he kidding? with a surprised look on his face. And Rob said, well, I don't know. Then Tom said in a little more authoritative voice, hurry, Joel, get off and get in the bush and start barking. Then Rob looked at Joel and said, no, nope, he's not kidding. You better get moving. So that's what he did. I was in the lead of the cattle and the boys laughing, relayed this la laughingly, relayed this episode to me later. So the boys had quite an experience with us. They helped round the cattle in the high Sierras, chased cows through the bush, went on a dusty trail ride, crossed a river with them, crawled through the brush and barked like a dog, all in one day and into the night. I wonder if that's why some folks say we treat our help like dogs. Every time I would see Rob and Joel, they would always bring up that time they went to the mountains always ask about Tom and what a great experience that was for them. They'd say, tell Tom hello. We sure like Tom. He was really a lot of fun to be around and so nice to us. Who else would teach someone to bark like a dog? Another time I was at a Ray Hunt clinic over on the west side on a ranch. After the clinic was finished one evening, a young lady was working with her horse. She was standing on a long bench and was trying to get her horse to lead up alongside side of it so she could get on him. Every time the horse would stop beside the girl, he would swing his hindquarters away from the bench. She tried a few times, but each time the same thing would happen. Ray was watching all this and it was frustrating him because the horse would swing his hindquarters away from the bench. Tom was doing something else and Ray said to Tom, feast your eyes on that. Just as Tom looked around, the girl's horse stepped over to the bench. She was still standing on it and he had his front feet on one side of the bench and his hind feet on the other side. The girl standing on the bench right beside him. When Tom saw that happen, he just bent over and started laughing. That's just right. And he kept laughing. Ray never did laugh, but Tom sure got a kick out of it. When I first met Tom, and for years after, he always liked to help people with their horses or cattle, but was most 
most pretty, pretty quiet and reserved. But as time went on, he and Margaret went to put on more clinics all over the country and in all parts of the world. He became more outgoing. I guess that's a good way to put it. For his 80th birthday, May 11th, 1991, folks came to the Merced Horseman Club for a horse clinic and dinner and lots of visiting for everyone. That evening, Tom was given a new hat. He took it out of the box, put it on. It fit just fine. Then he put his old hat in the box and all of a sudden, he kicked that box clear across the porch with as much enthusiasm as a football player kicking a field goal. Everyone laughed and I think a lot of us were surprised and said, wow, Tom's changed. I sit here smiling and laughing, thinking about these things I can remember. He had such a depth of knowledge of horses and cattle and an understanding of them that's helped so many people. He wasn't a perfect man, but none of us are. But he was very generous and unselfish with anyone who wanted him to help them with their horse. A, people didn't, a person didn't have to be a cowboy, and Tom was a good cowboy, or a cowgirl, or ride a certain kind of horse or in a certain kind of saddle. If someone was interested and asked him for help and understanding, he was willing. He's helped so many of us in different ways to be better horsemen and horsewomen, which also helps in all other areas of our lives. Thank you, Tom. So <laughs> there we go. That was a long one today. Thank you for joining me. And I look forward to seeing you next time. Keep tuning into the light. Thank you.